midcram.com. Welcome to another Midcram COVID-19 update. And actually, this is more of an update than just COVID-19, because today we're going to talk about a new medication that's been given emergency use authorization for COVID-19 ARDS, but I think it actually is going to have a much wider application. As you can see for now, COVID hospitalizations are really at an all-time low, and that's good. And as a pulmonary critical care physician working in the intensive care unit taking care of these patients, I'm never opposed to using the latest and greatest medications that we can to help these patients. During the COVID pandemic, steroids seem to help quite a bit. We also use monoclonal antibodies in the outpatient setting with infusion centers. And this new medication is a monoclonal antibody, but a completely different type of mechanism that has nothing to do with the virus. Many of the monoclonal antibodies were phased out because of viral mutation, making those monoclonal antibodies obsolete. That's not going to happen with this one because this monoclonal antibody is actually not directed against the virus, but against proteins that are endogenous to the human body. And we've talked a lot about medications, but we've also talked about things that we can do in our own lives to help prevent us from getting severe disease from COVID-19. So we talked about the case for sunlight. We actually also talked about this LED jacket in the near-infrared range. We talked about hydrotherapy, supplementation with vitamin D, nutrition. We talked about pathophysiologically how ARDS kills with COVID-19. We also talked about oxidative stress and getting out and getting fresh air. One of the things we talked about was ARDS. ARDS is the final common pathway for many viral illnesses, not only SARS-CoV-2, but just about every other virus that causes viral pneumonia can cause ARDS. So we're talking about influenza and a number of other viruses. And as you can see here, this fibrosis, which occurs in the lung, can cause problems with diffusion and also problems with the ability to stretch your lungs out and take a deep breath. And this can cause permanent disability. And as we'll discuss, it actually is caused by your own immune system, which is ramped up too high. So let's talk about our immune system and why that might be the case. The innate immune system is a portion of your immune system that deals with antigens, but in a way specifically that's not related to the particular type of antigen. So this is the innate immune system. It's not dependent on particular viral epitope. It's not dependent upon specifically an antibody. It is dependent, however, upon proteins in that complex. And this is known as the complement cascade. And what it starts off with is you have the infected cell with the antigen, the antibody response, which generates a C1 complex. And through a number of different amplifications, what happens is you finally get down to a situation where you have a protein called C3, which fragments into C3B and C3A fragments. And the C3B then goes on to this thing called C5 and cleaves it into a protein called C5B and C5A. Now, that's important to understand because C5B goes on to form with C6, 7, 8, and 9 a cylindrical complex membrane that actually destroys the cell and gets rid of the infection. That's what C5B does. And that's important because this type of an attack is very important in meningitis, among other things. We'll come back to that later. C5A, however, the other fragment, goes on and causes sometimes anaphylactoxin. It attracts neutrophils, which is what this cell is, and expresses a protein called CD11B. But this type of neutrophil response can be seen in a number of different diseases. It can be seen in ARDS and also a number of diseases. And so if it's possible to reduce this C5A response, you might be able to reduce damage, endotheliolitis, and microthrombosis. These are all things that we saw in COVID-19. This is the result of that C5A. C5A can cause this. So there are a number of interventions that we can potentially do. Here's the C3B fragment, which comes on here. It looks like a ghost that's ready to be eaten by Pac-Man. It cleaves C5, which is this whole thing here, into C5B and C5A. There's a couple of things that you should know. Trypsin can also do this on its own. Trypsin, which is something that's seen commonly, can also cleave C5 into C5B and C5A. There's a medication, which is a monoclonal antibody, called eculizumab. Eculizumab is an antibody against C5 total. 
And so obviously if you block C5, you're also going to block the ability of C5B from doing something, and therefore you're not going to be able to kill things as much. And so patients who get eculizumab must also get vaccinated against meningitis, specifically Neisseria meningitidis. The other medication here that we're going to look at today, which has gotten emergency use authorization, we'll talk a little bit more about, is velobilumab, or IFX. That was the old name for it. This is the trade name, Gohibic. And it is a monoclonal antibody against C5A only. So it does not prevent C5B from doing its thing that we like it to do. It just basically binds C5A and prevents it from doing what we don't want it to do. So here's a study that looks at eculizumab again. This is the original medication that blocks C5 directly. You can see here when we put C5 right here in the presence of trypsin, you're going to get a lot of C5A measurement. Now when you use IFX, which is the new medication that's gotten emergency use authorization, you can see here that it binds C5A and prevents this assay of CD11B on the neutrophils from being expressed. So it's doing exactly what we want it to do, whereas eculizumab does not prevent that from happening. And this is at various dosages. So the bottom line here is that eculizumab does not prevent or reduce C5A generation resulting from direct C5 cleavage by trypsin. And that's important to understand because if you want to reduce ARDS and inflammation, you have to reduce C5A generation. What happens when we give velobelumab, which is the new medication that's given emergency use authorization, what happens when you give it to a patient? So here's C5A in the patients. After day two, it drops and it stays down till about day 22 to day 29. Whereas if you give placebo, you can see that it remains elevated all throughout that process. Here is the randomized placebo-controlled trial that was done, phase three, and it was funded by the medication manufacturer, InflaRx, titled Anti-C5A Antibody, or Vilabilumab, Therapy for Critically Ill, Invasively Mechanically Ventilated Patients with COVID-19, a multi-center, double-blinded, randomized, placebo-controlled phase three trial. Now, I mentioned that it was funded by the manufacturer, but the methodology of the study was regulated by the FDA to make sure that it was done correctly. So let's look over this. This is a double-blinded placebo randomized controlled trial done in permuted block randomization. That means they were done two or four at a time. The number total was 368 with 177 in the intervention arm and 191 in the placebo. They were all age 18 or older. Number of hospitals across the world in Europe, North America, South America, and Africa. You can see the different countries here. It was done from October 1st, 2020 to October 4, 2021 and most of the patients in this trial were not vaccinated. They had to be on mechanical ventilation for less than 48 hours, and the PF ratios range from 60 to 200. And just briefly, the PaO2 normally in a patient without ARDS is about 100. The FiO2 on room air is 0.2, 1. So do the calculation, and you'll see that a normal PF ratio is about 500. Once you drop down to 300, that's mild ARDS, 200 is moderate ARDS, and 100 is severe ARDS. And you can see here then that most of these patients were moderate to severe ARDS. And the intervention was standard of care plus vilabelumab at 800 milligrams IV on days 1, 2, 4, 8, 15, and 22 versus matching placebo. And endpoint all-cause mortality at 28 days. Let's take a look here at the randomization. Looks pretty consistent, good randomization between the intervention and placebo, a little bit more placebo in Brazil. In terms of race, it was pretty much the same. Ethnicity and sex and age was also about the same with some small deviations. There was a little bit difference in terms of diabetes and the comorbidities. And BMI was exactly the same in both groups. The estimated glomerular filtration rate was a bit higher in the placebo group. And in terms of acute respiratory distress syndrome, these were pretty severe patients, as we talked about, a little bit more severe in the placebo group. In terms of time from first COVID-19 symptom to randomization, it was generally about 10 days, with the mean 11 days in the intervention and 10.8 in the placebo. In terms of randomization from the time of COVID-19 diagnosis, it was a little more than seven days. From time of hospital admission to randomization, it was about four days. And from intensive care unit to randomization, these patients were getting into the intensive care unit pretty quick because they were pretty sick. 
In terms of the eight-point WHO COVID-19 ordinal scale, these are pretty sick patients. You can see here they're pretty high scores and, generally speaking, pretty much the same across the board. Let's look at the results of this study. We're looking at mortality both at 28 days and also at 60 days. And I want to share something with you regarding how this went. A priori, so how they actually designed this study, was that they would look at everybody that was entered in the study the same. So that means no site stratification. However, as the trial was being undertaken, the FDA approached the authors of this study, the people that were doing it, and they wanted to have something called site stratification, which basically meant that they did not want to include any data from the smaller sites if there were no deaths at that site. So you can imagine there would be some sites where there were no deaths and they would just eliminate everybody at that site. Well, that meant that 61 people were eliminated and their N went from 368 to 307. So not only would this reduce the power of the study, but it could also affect, if there was alternate randomization, the effect of the study drug. And so as it turned out, even though you can see here on a mortality scale with red, which is placebo, having a higher mortality than blue, which is vilabilumab, that the statistical significance, even though there was a reduction, was not statistically significant. It was 0 0.09. At 60 days, it was 0 0.082. And so if they did include this data as they had anticipated that they would as a a priori, they would have actually made statistical significance. Let's take a look at this again. All cause mortality at 60 days, there was non-statistical significance. However, if they use the original version of the protocol using a predefined Cox regression analysis without site stratification, there was a significant reduction in all cause mortality at day 60 with a hazard ratio of 0 0.67, which represents a 33% reduction. And that was statistically significant. And it was because of this that the FDA allowed them to get emergency use authorization. By the way, the pre-specified post hoc analysis did show that the p-values were less than 0 0.05. So there was improvement of at least one point in the WHO COVID-19 ordinal scale on day 28, but that did not reach statistical significance. Also, there was no statistical significance in terms of kidney failure between the two groups. However, there was a protection against hemodialysis in those who got the medication, and that was barely, but it was statistically significant. If you look at the severity of people that came in, people who had moderate ARDS did not meet statistical significance, that those that had severe did meet statistical significance. Those with GFRs that were greater than 60 did not meet statistical significance, but those with less than 60 did meet statistical significance. And those on the ordinal scale that had a 6 did not meet statistical significance, but those that had 7 did meet statistical significance. And so this favored vilabilumab in those that had severe disease. So we showed efficacy. Let's talk about safety. So notice here that these are very sick patients. Anything can happen to them. And when you infuse this medication, anything that happens afterwards is going to be counted as a adverse event, treatment emergent adverse events. So they're going to be high. Notice 91% adverse events, but it was also in the placebo group. And that goes to speak again how sick these patients were. There was no real difference there. And you can see across the board as we go down that we're seeing actually a higher rate in the placebo group in these very sick patients. For acute kidney injury, no statistical significance. With pneumonia, there actually was a greater amount in the intervention group than there was in the placebo group. But remember, because there was a 33% reduction in mortality, that dead people don't get pneumonia. And so it's completely possible that so many people survived that they were able to get pneumonia. And that's what we might be seeing here. Nevertheless, in septic shock, it was lower. Infusion reaction in the intervention group, three of them got a rash. In the placebo group, so these are the people getting saline, there was one person who had actually cardiac arrest, and I don't think it was related to the saline. It was probably coincidence. These people, again, are very, very sick and coding all the time. In terms of infections, slightly higher in the intervention group. Here's the important thing. There were no cases of bacterial meningitis. But we would not expect that again because we said that when you have an antibody against just C5A, it's not going to prevent C5B from doing its thing and breaking up these infected cells, which is very important with meningitis. So no meningitis seen here in this cohort. So that's the efficacy and the safety. 
As I mentioned before, we're not seeing a lot of hospitalizations from COVID-19. So to the degree that people with COVID-19 come in and get on a ventilator within 48 hours, this is a new tool in the tool shed of those that are trying to keep these people alive. Again, though, I want to reiterate, this is a monoclonal antibody where you don't have to worry about the subvariant of Omicron or the variant of SARS-CoV-2 because this monoclonal antibody is not against the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein. It's against C5A, which is not mutating. It's your C5A. And it's your C5A that's sending off this signal to attract neutrophils and cause inflammation. So the question is, is could this medication also work for other viral pandemics? And here's a study that was published back in 2015 looking at H7N9. And there were some outbreaks in China back in 2013 and 2014, and therefore on a little bit, where we saw human beings that were very sick that got this infection, but were living close to chickens. Now, this particular study was looking at green monkeys, and it wasn't a large study at all, just looking at a few of them to see whether or not this antibody would improve the outcomes if they got H7N9. And the answer to that basically is it looks as though. So these are the lungs from these monkeys. Again, this is the IFX. That's the new medication that we were just talking about, the velabilimab. And what you notice here is that on day three and day seven, there seems to be greater amounts of aeration in the velabilimab treated monkeys than in the ones that were not treated that way. Here we can see the HE score, which is what we were just talking about. Notice the sham treated had much higher than the intervention. Viral titers were higher in the sham than they were in the intervention. Temperature was higher in the sham treated or the placebo than it was in the velabilimab group. And also we can see here that the actual medication listed here as IFX1 lasted for quite some time and was doing what it needed to do. Even though we're seeing a reduction in hospitalization specifically for COVID-19, there is an emergency use authorization for this medication for those that actually are. So it's not zero. There are people here that are still being admitted. And for those that end up on the ventilator for more than two days or on ECMO, that's another indication, this medication may actually be beneficial in preventing deaths, which is phenomenal. For healthcare providers, this is also a fact sheet for emergency use authorization for this medication known as Gohibic. I'll put a link in the description below so you can download this information and use it if you have a patient. For those of you taking care of COVID-19 patients on the ventilator, or even if they're not, don't forget that we have this continuing medical education course that is free online at our website, medcram.com. As you can see, it's gotten over a thousand reviews, five out of five stars. So I hope this has been helpful. Please subscribe, turn on notifications, give us a good comment, and join us at medcram.com. See you next time.